What if music is not meant to just entertain us? What if the true powers of music reach far, far beyond how we as a society use it today? As a musician, as a neuroscientist, and as a psychologist, I'm absolutely amazed and fascinated at this greater potential of music. And today, I'm going to share with you what colleagues and I from universities around the world have discovered about music's impact on the brain, on society, and how ultimately music can be a key to breaking down social barriers. But first, let's try an exercise together. First, take a glance at the person sitting to your right and sitting to your left. Don't be shy. <laughs> take a quick look. Look back towards me and repeat the melody after me. <laughs> now, how many of you consider yourself to be musicians? How many of you consider yourself not to be musicians? Okay. Even with the lights, I can see that's the vast majority. <laughs> but even so, each and every one of you were able to follow me and also sing with each other. And see, that's because music is deeply seated in the human brain and, as we'll soon see, also in the human heart. As we were singing together, science shows that oxytocin, the bonding hormone, was increasing. And cortisol, the stress hormone, was decreasing. There's also an area in the brain that was activated. It's called the medial prefrontal cortex right here, and it's linked to our autobiographical memory. So even though we were singing together, individually we were also tapping into our personal identities. It's not just these areas that were being active when we were singing together. In fact, my colleagues and I at bar Ilan University and the University of Chicago have been mapping the brain when people are playing music together, and we see that there's entire brain networks that become active, from empathy circuits to areas responsible for reward and motivation and for communication. Now, together, we were just singing for a few moments, very quickly. But what if we were to sing together for a few hours? Or what if we were to actually sing together for a few days? What would happen to us as a group? In the winter of 2019, right before the COVID-19 pandemic, I had a rare opportunity to travel to New York and study a group of 200 singers who were getting together at a four-day singing workshop. They were singing Jewish Nagunum, which is very similar to the type of song that we just sang at the beginning of the talk. It features wordless melodies, repetition, and spontaneity. These three musical elements can be traced back to our ancient human ancestors and their tribal communities. Before and after the singing at the workshop, the singers huddled around me, and they completed paper and pencil psychometric tests, and they also provided saliva samples for hormone analysis. The results from the workshop far exceeded my expectations. A sense of togetherness and bonding, on average, after the four days, increased by 37%, and any stress or anxiety that the singer started out with after the four days, it had decreased by 33%. These are very high numbers for natural, non-clinical, and non-pharmacological activity. So if together we were all to spend a couple of days singing, we would be bonded. We would have a sense of togetherness. We would have a shared community. Now, when it comes to social bonding, music doesn't just impact the brain, it also impacts something profound in us psychologically and behaviorally. A few years ago, I started the Musical Universe Project. It's an online platform where people can go online and take different psychological and musical tests and find out their scores immediately, and also learn about themselves in the process. 
So far, 300,000 people have participated around the world. And the analysis of the data shows that there are direct links between people's musical habits and their personality traits. So for example, if you like more energetic and rhythmic music, you're likely to be extroverted. If you like more mellow and romantic music, you're likely to be agreeable. And if you prefer more intense and rebellious music, you're likely to be rebellious yourself. And if right now you're looking at me in this very quizzical look because your playlist is filled with music from different genres and styles, you're likely to score high on a trait called openness to new experience. These findings about music and personality show us that through music, we're communicating our inner world and we're broadcasting that to the outer world without language. Now, some of these findings between music and personality are intuitive. But what's remarkable about these findings is that they appear in more than 50 cultures around the world. So somebody in Brazil who enjoys intense and rebellious music is likely to share the same traits as somebody in India who likes the same type of music. The fact that these patterns are popping up all over the world, even with the diversity of languages and diversity of cultural histories, points to music as a possible bridge between people from different cultures. During the past several years, I've had the immense privilege to work with an ensemble called the Jerusalem Youth Chorus. Each and every week, this chorus brings together Israeli teenagers and Palestinian teenagers to learn songs from each other's musical languages. Here's an example of what the chorus created together. Settle down, it'll all be clear Don't pay no mind to the demons, they fill you with fear Trouble, it might drag you down If you're lost, you can always be found Just know you're not alone you know, I'll never forget the time when I saw the chorus for the first time. It was at a rehearsal and I was sitting in the back with professors Ehud Bodner and Moshe Bensaman, and we watched in amazement as we knew the chorus was engaged in something much greater than all of us. When I had an opportunity to interview the members of the chorus, they spoke about how music was a common language between them, and how even though they have differences, through music they're able to stand side by side. The science also backs them up. Studies show that making music together can improve our empathic behavior towards others and also decrease false and negative stereotypes. This new frontier of how we can use music is why researchers are joining myself and musicians in a new initiative which is going to use music as a bridge not just between Israelis and Palestinians, but between people all around the world. We're even going to use music as a bridge with autistic people who find it often difficult to navigate their social worlds. In fact, at the University of Cambridge, at the Autism Research Center, my colleagues and I are about to launch a $1.5 million randomized control trial to study the effectiveness of music therapy in autistic children. <laughs> so far, I've been talking about the impact of music on social groups, but I want to end with an example of how music can bond just two people. When I was just two weeks old, I was in the hospital in the intensive care unit with sepsis, kidney malfunction. I was hanging on to life by a thread. One day, my grandfather volunteered to spend the day with me in the hospital. 
I wonder what my grandfather was thinking, looking down at his sick grandchild. He couldn't hold me because I was in an incubator, so he decided to connect with me in another way, through song. He spent that whole day singing Jewish melodies to me, melodies that were likely sung to him by his grandparents. After that day, I began a healthy recovery, and I'm here with you today. My grandfather passed when I was just five years old, so I never had the opportunity to ask him what songs he sang to me that day in the hospital. But that's not the end of the story. Let's fast forward to when I'm 27 years old, I'm living in New York City, and I have a song stuck in my head that I can't get out. I had never heard the song before that point, but it's actually the song that we just sang together at the very beginning of my talk. We can sing it all together, if you remember. Soon after that, I came across a home video that I had never seen before in my life. The video was of me and my grandfather just days after I returned from the hospital um, as a healthy baby. And what I saw next on the video absolutely blew me away. My grandfather is there holding me, and he looks up at the camera and says, do you want to hear David's favorite song? And he sings. See, the song that he sang to me as a baby created such a deep bond that it's lasted my entire life, connecting me to my grandfather and to the music. We are only at the beginning of understanding music's full potential. But what we do know is that music is not just entertainment. Music is much, much more. For some reason, many of us have this idea that music is just about going to concerts or about listening to music on our earbuds, but it's much more. It's about connecting us, connecting us to ourselves and connecting us to others, others who are similar to us and others who are different than us. Given all of these scientific findings, as a musician, as a neuroscientist, and as a psychologist, I encourage each and every one of you to do something this week, just one thing, that will bring music to your home communities. Don't be shy. Sing. In this time of social division and fragmentation, we need music. So sing. Sing to your children. Sing with your friends. And most importantly, sing with those who are different than you. And together, through music, we'll build bridges and we'll together step into a better future. Thank you. <laughs>